Uh, beginning on the far left, I hope it's your far left, we have Senator Amanda Shelton. And then to her right, we have Christopher Francisco, Clinical Supervisor for Salvation Army Lighthouse Recovery Center. And then we have Attorney General Lehman Titano Camacho. And to his left, we have Ms. Ramona McManus, Executive Director for Oasis Empowerment Center. And then Ms. Anne-Marie Pangalinen, Resident Manager of Oasis. Uh, now online with us, we have Ms. Athena Duenas from Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center. Uh, so there she is. Okay, great. Now that we've introduced everybody, I'll go ahead and turn it over to the AG for opening remarks. Thank you, Carlina, and hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, you know, our office has committed early on to securing resources to fight Guam's drug problem, and we're here in an exciting day to announce that, to summarize that we've secured upwards of $14 million now, and the next phase is to make sure that money gets to where it is needed and where it will be effective. And this is our, part of our office's broader and holistic approach to building safer communities because an investment in drug rehabilitation, treatment, and mental health issues is really how, what we need to do to build safer communities. None of this would be possible or would, would mean anything without community collaboration. So I wanna thank everyone at this table for being here today and for working with us. And you know, I don't wanna repeat the introductions that Carlina gave. And it's nice to, to be sitting with uh, Ms. McManus and. Uh, Mr. Christopher from Lighthouse, and we've had Zoom calls before we got our first settlement with McKinsey, and we're, part of the reason why we're here today is to sign off on memorandums of understanding, as well as, well as Guam Behavioral, where we dedicated, I think, over $100,000 to, to them to find additional staff to help with their, their programs and their treatment programs. Um, so the first part of this, I guess, is going to be just to formalize the signing of these memorandums of understanding, and you know, I, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, but um, you realize just how much a couple hundred dollars can do. And, and I think it was, they were saying having a hundred dollars or $200 utility bill outstanding yeah. could mean the difference between getting into a housing program and being taken care of for aftercare and, and not being able to get into those programs. So, you know, really took to heart a couple hundred dollars to pay utility bill. And now you can get that support to stay out, to stay clean um, and to continue on with your treatment. So what we've done is we've uh, allocated about $7,500 to start for both of our direct service providers which will be used to do things like acquire driver's licenses, driver's education, um, other types of supplies and incentive programs. And it's just great to have you guys here. We've been working on this for a few weeks, a few months actually. Uh, so we'll, we'll sign this and then uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next part of our agenda. And I, I don't know if you wanna share anything, um, Chris or, or Ramona? Yeah, we're, um, we're very uh, grateful for the funds that are coming into our program. We will put it to use, I mean, one of the factors that one of the contributing factors to people moving from treatment to long term sobriety is support mm -hmm. and filling in those gaps and needs. You'd be surprised how many people don't have a driver's license mm -hmm. or have bills um, like outstanding uh, utility bills that prevent them from establishing housing or being participating in public services. And so this will definitely help to bridge that gap. And thank you very much. Yes. Yes, thank you indeed. I echo that as well. Um, I think we're both on the same level with that. It, it really does. It's, uh, it definitely assists those that are uh, in treatment and coming out. It's a way to, you know, be able to take that next step into the community and, um, you know, serve as well themselves. So thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Duenas, I know you're online and it's harder because we can't uh, look you in the eye and uh, <laughs> give you there, but if you, I don't know if you want to add anything. We've actually entered into this MOU with Quam Behavioral a few months ago, um, just to help you guys with your recruiting efforts. So, you know, um, it, just, just having extra counselors is always a big deal for us because we always need, we always need treatment providers. Um, so, you know, having uh, this money and, and of course, since we're opening shop up at DOC, it helps, it helps us a lot in terms of finding, uh, you know, funding for treatment providers. Thank you. Um, so again, this is just the first part of it. And, and this is the McKinsey settlement. We have a few other settlements and the second piece of it, that's very exciting. And Senator Shelton, I'll turn it over to you. If you could just talk a bit about um, why you're here today and, and see you with us. Sure, thank you very much, Attorney General, to you and your team for allowing me to be a part of this and our community partners who are here today. This is a, a really exciting day. I know that uh, this 
it all started with a conversation several years ago where uh, I was interested in what Guam was going to get from uh, these opioid case settlements. And so this is how our relationship started. And we began working with your team to uh, develop legislation to help ensure that these funds that we receive through uh, this, these settlements are used uh, to benefit our community, to combat addiction, to help prevent addiction, and to uh, provide treatment for those in our community. So I'm really uh, proud and honored today to announce that we introduced Bill 204 this morning uh, that will do just that. So Bill 204 is sponsored by myself and eight of my other colleagues in the legislature, uh, and it will establish the Opioid Recovery Trust Fund. It does four things. It establishes this trust fund, and then it ensures that all of the money that we collect from this litigation will go into this trust fund and will be used specifically uh, for uh, treatment, for prevention, uh, to help uh, our community. And then a three, it also uh, establishes the Opioid Recovery Advisory Council. So this will be uh, a group of people, experts, government partners, uh, who will be able to guide us with a strategy of how to best use this money for our community. So knowing the needs of our community, the changing needs, and we'll be able to identify those to use the, the money the best way we know how. And then uh, lastly, it designates the Office of the Attorney General as our single agency to bring claims against any establishments with regards to opioid to uh, help Guam get 100% of uh, these settlements that are available to us. So we're very happy to be here, to be partners with all of you, uh, to ensure that we're going to help our community in the best way possible to create safer communities and to uh, treat uh, drug addiction as well as prevent any further harm from opioid abuse here on our island. Thank you very much, Attorney General, and your team. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Instead, I know we're excited, and uh, this is this is great to be here and yeah. sitting with you all. And one thing I know we get a lot of questions: opioids are a bigger problem on the island than, than I think many of us recognize. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have to acknowledge that ICE still is the biggest mm -hmm. yes. drug problem we're facing. Mm -hmm. So, as opposed to other types of funding, the the settlements that our office has secured really says it's for opioid use disorder or any co-occurring yes. mental health or substance abuse issues and i don't know uh mona if you could just talk about the significance of saying it's not just for opioid use disorder it could be for anything else that's co-occurring yes it well one was you're not putting them in a box <laughs> of just singular to that um this branches out because along with court for co-occurring that it reaches everyone yeah um you know in substance use um you're not just stigmatizing just to that specific and yes otherwise you know there's other funding that is very specific too so this is broader scale and which is really resourceful and helpful to the community um, Ms. Duenas do you have anything that you'd like to add I know that you, you know with Guam behavioral the significance of having that flexibility to be both for opioid use disorder as well as uh, co-occurring yeah, I mean, you know, you know, when we work with individuals with a substance use disorder, um, they usually come in not just using one substance, they usually come in using them all. So, you know, uh, this is very helpful that uh, it applies not to just that, but it also applies to individuals too, as well, who have a co-occurring mental health disorder. So, you know, we have, um, that's about a good 20, 30% of our population that we serve uh, in the drug and alcohol programs uh, to include Oasis and the Lighthouse. So, you know, it, it's it's nice that that money can go towards, you know, the whole, as Mona was saying. But yeah, they usually come in using opioids and meth. So <laughs> it will be helpful to um, work, you know, uh, with the consumers that um, they're just not stopping one substance. They're trying to work on stopping all. Thanks. Chris, you have anything to add? Or? Uh, yeah, so, uh, particularly when it comes to opioids, I, I can say that I've worked with uh, several clients who tried to mitigate the effects of uh, withdrawals from opioids by using other substances uh, mm -hmm. such as meth. And so that can be problematic in and of itself. As far as uh, co-occurring, you know, working with the clients that I do work with, a lot of the substance use disorders that are developed have a deeper underlying mental health issue. Yes. It could be trauma, anxiety or depression. And so 
you know, we try and treat it holistically, not just the substance use disorder. And sometimes we have to partner with Bond Behavioral Health to address those issues. So, um, with that, I, I guess I'll just provide a little bit more of an overview of the litigation that we're involved in, and I guess when we can expect some of this money to, to start coming in. Um, we did already receive about two hundred thirty thousand, and that's part of what's being done with MOU today, as well as our partnership with Guam Behavioral. And we have put out, we've started the procurement for toxicology reports, and the next phase is going to be putting together an educational campaign on uh, the dangers of opioid use disorder and, and addiction, especially yes. and targeting our yes. youth. So mm -hmm. that's going to be yeah, the next phase. Right. Um, and I, I see our, our chief of staff and deputy Fred Nishihiro is on the line. So he's seeing all these things and he's adding them to the his to do list <laughs> as, as we move forward. Um, within the last two weeks, the a bankruptcy court in Purdue, and that's the first case that we filed that prompted the, the call from Senator Shelton. And, and I you know, applaud you for being proactive in this, making sure that we are gonna help address these problems. So that was just approved about two weeks ago. Under that settlement alone, there's about upwards of uh, 1.8 million that Guam was looking to receive. And part of the terms is that we have legislation in place to ensure that the, the judgment is gonna be complied with. So this bill will help carry that out. And again, make sure that we're gonna get the most that we can and maximize our ability to settle. Um, the 10 million that we're looking at upwards of is from our settlement with Johnson and Johnson. That's the Johnson and Johnson settlements, 5 billion over nine years. And so the payments are going to be front loaded. And then for the opioid distributors, there's about three of them. We're looking at 21 billion over 18 years. So, um, wow. again, of that amount, we're looking at upwards of $10 million over that same period. Uh, we are at the stage now where subdivisions are going to, and the States are going to decide whether to join on. And by January of next year, we'll know if we've reached the settlement terms necessary, but payments could start as early as July of 2022. Wow. So it's going to be really important to establish and set up a plan yeah. and to start these, these very good discussions. Um, I do want to say that we have Oasis and Lighthouse and Guam Behavior on the call, but there are other community partners who may be out there. And you know, as we, this is just the beginning of these discussions as we determine the best way to use these funds and the most effective way to use these funds. And with that, uh, I guess I want to just recognize, I already recognized our deputy chief of staff, Fred Nishihira, but Joseph Perez, Jojo Perez, who's, who've been on the calls again for three o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, waking up uh, to make this happen. And I, and I will share with you that when I was explaining to Jojo just the benefit or the impact that a couple hundred dollars can mean mm -hmm. to someone who is getting into a program or not, um, it's very rewarding to, yeah. to be part of this office and to be part of this broader effort. So with that, um, I guess we can... Open it up to Q&A. Hi, thank you. I actually see a couple folks who join who are joining us. Uh, Ms. Fowl, would you like to say anything? Hi, I just want to say congratulations to the treatment providers because we're celebrating Recovery Month. And mm -hmm. then also um, this is a beautiful program that will benefit clients. Um, the Lighthouse Recovery Center made the decision that um, all of the funds will go towards the clients. And so um, we're, we're excited about what we can use the money to do uh, more help, to use it for more help for our clients. So we're excited and we just want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you, Ms. Val. Uh, Ms. Val is from Lighthouse uh, with Chris. Um, now, moving on, I will go ahead and begin the Q&A session with our press partners who've joined us today. Uh, I've got Sorensen up first, or News to Talk K57. Please go ahead. 57, uh, this question is for either Guam Behavioral Health or any of the stakeholders. Uh, do we have the number of people we're treating today for op opioid abuse? I think it, um, this is Athita from Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center. I think it varies with um, the different agencies, um, which is the Lighthouse, our, myself and the Oasis. Um, right now, as, as um, I know it in our MAT program, we have about 15 individuals who are currently receiving medication for, um, for their opioid addiction. Um, through our medically assisted treatment program up at Guam Behavioral. And then we also have our um, 3.7 unit that's open. And um, I think we've already had about three people go through that program recently who have also received uh, 
medically assisted treatment. So it's medication that they use to assist to get off of the opioids, which um, it's pretty, it's going pretty well. But I mean, those are our numbers right now. It doesn't mean that the lighthouse doesn't have any and the Oasis doesn't have any because they, they, we share consumers at this point. <laughs> Right. Maybe maybe you can also talk about uh, co-occurring abuse, how they, you know, I guess they're using diff- they're abusing different kinds of drugs. OK, so um, I know that for a majority of our consumers that come in, um, usually people have a preference. They have they have like their favorite, you know, um, but we're seeing today that a lot of them come in uh, and I know Chris Francisco mentioned it earlier. Um, if they're trying to get off opioids, they'll use marijuana, they'll use another, they'll use methamphetamines, and then vice versa, you know, trying to get off methamphetamines, going towards something like Xanax or any other prescription drug that might assist to help them um, relax a little bit more when they're going through some anxiety provoking uh, symptoms. Um, so it's kind of like a give and take, you know, when you're trying to get off drugs and thinking that it, it's harmless not realizing how harmful it can be. And then we had those individuals who um, every once in a while we get those that um, they use anything and everything under the sun to get high. Um, And usually they come into our unit when uh, they're at a point where they're now having um, psychosis due to um, the drugs that they're using. Uh, Mm -hmm. So that, you know, in and of itself is another co-occurring disorder, you know, having hallucinations or paranoia and having to be placed in our um, adult inpatient unit because of those symptoms. So, I mean, that's that's part of it. I don't know if um, Chris Francisco or Mona would like to share or give more information on that. Uh, I can say that, uh, like uh, the attorney general was saying, uh, earlier, ICE is the predominant uh, issue that we face. Uh, Opioids are a distant second, but uh, in the past five years, we've seen an increase. Um, As far as numbers go, I don't have the data in front of me right now, Mm -hmm. but it is, we're seeing an increase in opioid people coming in just specifically Mm -hmm. to address uh, opioids. Now, when we say opioids, that's like Percocets or uh, uh, Percocets or methadone, heroin, things like that, painkillers, basically. Mm-hmm. So there is a rise. Uh, yeah. Especially even, especially during with this pandemic yeah. as well, just a, a real high increase. Yeah, the, coming in, so. yeah, the pandemic has, uh, has been detrimental to people's uh, recovery efforts, particularly because of the isolation that was yes. not healthy. Yes, you know. agreed. Yeah. Agreed and if I may, I think Ms. Val's got something to add to that, Ms. Val. Okay. Um, So while Ms. Athena was um, talking, I was uh, just kind of analyzing the 2020 data. And um, so we had 118 alcohol, um, 46 alcohol plus drugs. And so we're not quite sure if that's what type of drug, but we know that it was alcohol plus drug. Um, 25 were poly, 38 marijuana. And the AG was absolutely correct. We had 346 clients seeking treatment for methamphetamine and 25 for opiates. Just, um, but uh, we know that that those numbers are are high from comparing from you know um, different years, and yet these are low numbers altogether because this was during the pandemic. Um, but for 25 folks seeking treatment, we, uh, who are struggling with opiates. Um, I'm, I'm almost sure that uh, Miss Athena and, uh, and, um, and uh, Oasis will say, you know what, 25 is a lot of, it's, it's a lot of people for us on Guam. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, in, in uh, 2009, I think there was three. And so if you just kind of look at the, the two numbers, three to 25, that's a lot. So are, are we, are, are some falling through the the gaps because we don't have enough resources, like maybe the number is even higher. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, K57, oh. for your. Oh, I'm sorry, boss. I don't. I think there are some people who want to answer that question. Yes. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Yes. So okay. I think the question was: Are people falling through the through the gaps because of not having um, 
I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Because we probably don't have the resources already in place, uh, the, the, whether it's Guam Beho Behavioral Health and Wellness or uh, any of the stakeholders for that matter, or maybe they're not reporting because maybe we don't have the proper education tools, they don't know that the programs exist. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, I think first and foremost, like um, usually when people do seek treatment, sometimes uh, they don't know that treatment's available. So getting the word out and doing uh, like uh, a community outreach is important. Um, and then probably not having enough providers to meet the needs like Athena was saying earlier is uh, also important to address, you know, but there are, there is help out. There is help out there. Uh, us, Guam Behavioral and Oasis, we're, we're here to provide help to people. Yes. And we do, um, when we do outreaches, we kind of, uh, um, we give that information out. Plus we partner with the court, uh, the court, uh, mm -hmm. as well as DOS, as um, like RSAT, the RSAT program to help spread uh, the word of uh, treatment services in the community. Mm -hmm. I'm very dense. And when I started this work and they said, oh, we need more beds. I'm like, oh, we just need more beds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess that's code that's for, <laughs> you need treatment providers yeah. Yeah. And, and the resources. And, and we're, or, I mean, it sounds like there's always room to expand yes. Yeah, and the number and the, your capacity to provide services, both of you guys, right? And um, yeah. yeah, I think the demand far exceeds uh, the supply the of supply. Uh, when it comes to substance use disorder treatment. Yeah. Yes, so it I think just I think too the, the, had mentioned earlier, um, Athena had mentioned that even the resources of of counselors. Counselors. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think too. I uh, you know they're weary about the treatment program. You know, even though they they know that there's medication that can help them get off, I think they're really weary about um, whether you know it's it's really that helpful or what we can do for them. Um, you know, when we have consumers come in for opiate use, a lot of them are shocked because we have this program because they don't they they feel like they didn't you know they didn't know. So when they do finally come in, then it ends up becoming word of mouth. And that's how we end up getting more people in is because they're going, you know, they become peers and they go out and they say, hey, no, I did it. This is what happened. The medication is there. You can come in. So that's mm -hmm. how it's it's starting to, you know, kind of get out into the public about us being able to help. You know, I remember years back when we didn't have the MAT program, I had several people coming in my office and they said, well, we're not going to come in unless you have the medication. And we didn't, you know, and I had to say, I'm sorry, I wish I could do more for you. But you know, we we want to provide you the treatment, uh, but they wouldn't come in unless they we had the meds for it for MAT like Suboxone. Um, I think now that we have it, um, it it they end up sharing the information to the to their friends that uh, are still using and still suffering with the ills of addiction, especially with uh, uh, prescription drug use, um, and it, it's really hitting our young adult population. And we're talking between the age of 18 and 27. So um, I think they're weary about the, the, the medication and weary about the, the treatment program. Um, so we wanted the public to know, hey, you know, come on in. This is, this is the time where we have the medication. It's here. It's free. <laughs> the services are free. You know, come in and take advantage of that. Thank you. If I, if, if I could just clarify something real quick. So uh, withdrawals from any sort of substances are very uncomfortable. Withdrawals from opioids are particularly uncomfortable because yeah. opioids are painkillers mm -hmm. and the withdrawals are pain, are painful. And some, some of the consumers that I've uh, come into contact with aren't using to get high anymore. They're just using to get normal. Mm -hmm. And so that's when, when we talk, when Athena is talking about medication, it's medication to help cope with the withdrawals from opioids. Yes. So um, this is Valerie again. So uh, Miss Athena and I, in our early days, well, my early days, um, <laughs> we had to share um, clients. And the saddest part about it is we have had to go to many funerals of folks that had accidentally overdosed. And so for Miss Athena and I, we see, we have seen um, folks that have been struggling with this drug for the past... <laughs> I don't want to say a number, okay, because of that ages us, but <laughs> but double digit <laughs> years, they've been struggling. And finally, finally, we have something to offer so that they're not experiencing that extreme pain while they're trying to get their lives back on track. So great job.
Thank you, Ms. Val. KUAM, you have questions for our panel? Yes, I have a question for you. As we know, opioid abuse is a growing problem in Guam. So how can pharmaceutical companies help prevent the use of opioid abuse? Uh, well, I, I want to recognize, I believe there was a public law that was recently passed that uh, authorized e-prescriptions. Um, and I, I, it might have been Speaker Talahi actually who introduced it. So when you talk to doctors, um, people who are forging prescriptions, we had a law before that everything had to be in writing. So uh, it was kind of backwards. Any controlled substance had to be in writing. And now we're able to monitor a little bit better through e-prescription. Uh, I want to give recognize the work of the Department of Public Health and Social Services. They have their prescription drug monitoring program which is also aimed at identifying you know, red flags for folks who might be going from uh, provider to provider uh, and, and monitoring that. But you know, at the end of the day, and this is really what is so dangerous about opioids, it's legal. And you have a prescription, um, you know, we, we have to strike that balance, but it's not like ice where it's, it's an illicit substance. So mm -hmm. if you find someone and on their persons is uh, ice pipe with residue, mm -hmm and a bottle of Percocet, there's only one crime that's been committed there, which mm -hmm. is the, the pipe with residue. Right. So, you know, I, I think our, our, pharmace our pharmacists in particular, um, we already have to build, look at the infrastructure, but this goes back to the, the beauty of the bill that's been introduced is that we need to be, identify where the gaps are and invest the money where it's gonna work. So if it's about beefing up prescription drug monitoring program, if that's an evidence-based solution to curb, let's do it. But if you're going to get more value in doing a youth prevention and targeted mm -hmm. um, campaign, then, then you have to decide how you're going to best use your resources. And, and there's a lot of materials that are out there. Um, but at the end of the day, there's a lot that can happen. It's just even $14 million is a lot, but it's it's going to get eaten up quickly in terms of yes, yes. the amount of, of, of infrastructure that we need in place. Yes. Does our online panel have anything to add before we move on? Okay, great. Like KBM, to, you have another question. Yes, I would like to add one more. You had mentioned earlier that there were plans for an educational campaign. When can we expect to see that in the works? Uh, so the, the first step, you know, the one thing I'm learning in, in government is procurement uh, is not quick. So <laughs> we had to put together a proposal. We've been in contact with other jurisdictions who have put together campaigns, but I wanna stress evidence-based and evidence-supported measures. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm learning just in the language that we use in these campaigns, like an, an addict or addiction, like you have, there are certain things in the way that the language that we use when we talk about these issues and recognizing mental health issues, it's a substance abuse uh, uh, issue, something that can be fixed, right? We're not calling them an addict and that's it. They're, they're beyond help. So, you know, we want to make sure that when we put together a campaign, it's going to use proven and established and effective ways of communicating with our young. Um, I actually think next month is Take Back Drug Day. And, mm. you know, I, I actually was looking at trying to promote it with our manamku who might have, what do you mm. do? You know, you get a, your tooth pulled and you have a vial of, a, Tylenol, of three. Tylenol 3 or yeah. prescription. They tell you don't give it to anyone else. Yeah. But how many of our, our elders have their old school medicine cabinet yes. that they just store their opioids, not realizing that that can be a real danger and, and a way for people to get access to drugs that you wouldn't even know about it and wouldn't have a prescription. So one of the things that we've been working on is trying to get the word out to our manamku, put your drugs in the right place. Don't flush it down the toilet. <laughs> Go back to these DEA take back drugs day and, and get rid of them the right way and, and we can help. So um, yes, uh, we can hopefully within the next, it's a new fiscal year in the next, well, actually this week, and we're going to start working on putting together our RFP and some of the folks that are sitting here at the table, you know, we want to invite to participate in that as we, we move forward. Thank you. Uh, do we have PN here with a question? Uh, yes, hi. <clears throat> um, so you mentioned earlier that the that the, the McKenzie, money from the McKenzie settlement has has come through basically, right? That's what's being distributed right now. And that's what's going to pay for the education campaign. Could you go over again uh, the source of the fourteen million dollars you mentioned? You mentioned ten million dollars sure. from Purdue. I'm sorry, not from Purdue. Ten million dollars from yeah. So if you can go over that again and, and maybe uh, explain who decides which um, programs or, or groups get this money. Is it the AG's office? Uh, no, no. So uh, so I, I'll start with the first question. Uh, Steve, is that right? 
Steve? Yes, yes. Okay. So the, the, the first case that we filed was against Purdue Pharmaceuticals, and that, that's been in bankruptcy court for quite a while now, but the court within the last two weeks approved a supplemental or a plan. And under that, there's a up to $10 billion total. And of that amount, so it starts at 4.5 billion and upwards of 10 billion. If, if there's only 4.5 billion, Guam's looking at receiving about $1.8 million from that settlement. Um, and that, that case is gonna move forward and we'll provide updates as needed. Then there was, I wanna say $26 billion that was between Johnson and Johnson and three distributors. And of that amount, that's where we're getting the $10 million from. So in terms of who gets the money and, and how that money is going to be allocated, we didn't have this, this bill in place uh, when we got McKinsey. So we've been going off of best practice. John Hopkins has a great website on what evidence programs are, are, are going to be a good use of funds. So we've done our toxicology reports because we don't have a baseline. Um, I, I know Ms. Val was saying that we have people who pass away because of overdose. We don't have the resources now where we're checking to see if someone dies from an opioid use uh, disorder or they, they fall and they hit their head. You know, it's blood force trauma to the head. It's not opioid use, but why did they, why did they fall? Mm -hmm. So we're hoping through toxicology reports and getting better analysis, we can start identifying poly drug deaths and get a better baseline for where we're at. Um, and then we've also, the art, we've talked about the, the ad campaign that we're gonna put together. But what this bill does is it establishes a commission and a trust fund puts all the money into it. And then we decide as the, not me, but the nine members decide as a commission, how to best and, and most effectively use this money. All right, thank you. Okay, we're just gonna circle back to K57. Do you have additional questions? Okay, great. Hannah with KUAM. Yes, my next question would be, you know, this is a growing problem in Guam, but just how extensive is the use of opioids and drugs? That's really hard to quantify. Yeah. Um, I will say this, that I bet everybody in this room Everybody on the panel, everybody in the sound of, uh, you know, within the sound of my voice, probably is one or two people removed from somebody with a substance use disorder problem, or maybe uh, abuses substances. You know, uh, the data that we have is only for people that come through our program. But if you take that data and you span it out, to, uh, you know, uh, percentage wise to the islands, I, I, I don't even want to try and uh, take a gander at what the percentage is. But just open a newspaper and and think about how many crimes are committed are that are related to drugs and things like that, and mm -hmm. it'll give you a rough a rough estimation. I'm oh, sorry, I can't be more uh, specific than that. <laughs> I mean, if you look at it this way, not all of them have a prescription, so they're buying it off the street from other people who do. So mm -hmm. you know, these days, uh, Percocet goes for about what sixty dollars. A pill? Mm. Is it something like that? It also, it also starts off at home. That's the, most, oh, yeah. that's the number one place mm -hmm. because at home they can just get it easily accessible mm -hmm. from their family members who are going through any kind of pain medication. And it starts off with there. And then, of course, they need to get the next fix. And if they're out of it at their house, then they'll go elsewhere, whether to get it from their dealer or to so, start doing so extra crime and doing others along the way. So we, you know, a lot of our um, opioid uh, individuals who've come in for opioid use disorders uh, got picked up for meth. Uh, but when you they come into treatment, we do their assessment, we find out that yeah. their real true problem is um, the opioids or benzodiazepines like Xanax. So, because when they come into treatment, they're willing to give up meth, but <laughs> they have a difficult time giving up the prescription drugs. <laughs> so that's that's usually what uh, how we we get our consumers through the court system. Thank you, Athena. Do we have any other questions from our media partners? Uh, K57, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right, so when uh, counseling and treating, what do the patients have in common for abusing opioids? Mm. Mm. Um, uh, 
uh, not to be a preliminary thing, but none of them chose to none of them chose to develop a opioid use disorder. Yeah. No, no, it's not a moral deficit or anything like that. They weren't. They didn't become. Uh, they didn't develop an opioid use disorder because they were bad people or anything. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, the only decision they had was the first time they used. And every time after that, it was motivated by the more primal, mm -hmm. uh, basic, instinctual part of the brain. I would say that not just that that is the commonality be, because it differs in so far as socioeconomic class, uh, upbringing, race, ethnicity. The, the one thing that is uh, present with all these clients is that you know, they, um, you know, it wasn't because of a moral deficit and they didn't choose to become, uh, you know, become just use uh, the vernacular addicted to drugs. Yeah, no yeah. one chooses to be. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you some of also, it depends on each consumer coming in. Each consumer is different where sometimes they're dealing with a co current, current disorder. And so um, we've been seeing a lot of that lately where they come in, a consumer comes in just for meth, um, and then six months later comes back in for treatment, and all of a sudden they're addicted to Xanax or some other um, drug that they added on to their list that they've already, yeah. For some of the uh, individuals that we work with with an opiate use disorder, some of them started out with an injury, a car accident, a sports injury, they were given some medication and continued with the medication and then developed the dependency because of it. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think the one common thing that the consumers we've worked with, or I've had the privilege of working with, they all want to quit. For me, that's the one common thread pretty much throughout all the substances, but, uh, the question was with regards to opiates, they all want to quit. And then uh, my last question is uh, for the attorney general. Uh, do we see any of the uh, settlement funds going to be used for local anti-drug enforcement? Like as in terms of law enforcement? Right, or is this all going to go towards uh, treatment? I, again, I, you know, with, uh, with what the bill is putting in place, this is the start of a conversation. Um, I know a lot of models are harm reduction, and yeah, I, I think you shouldn't have to get arrested to be aware of some of the great programs that are being run out of Oasis and Lighthouse Recovery. So anything that we can do to get our law enforcement more engaged, to kind of divert people away from the criminal justice system, um, the adult drug court is a great program, the, the family recovery uh, program is a great program. But the reality is all those cases started with a person in need of services or a criminal complaint. And, and our goal in law enforcement, it, again, is to, we build safer communities by investing in these resources so they don't get arrested to begin with. And I think that's really, uh, it's hard to think about that as being an investment in law enforcement, but all the programs that we're running here um, really do help build safer communities. So we'll, we'll see where we go, but I, I'm definitely looking forward to some of the discussion on this community policing and harm reduction and potential diversion at the, at the onset. Thank you for the time. Wonderful, thank you. Panel members, AG, do we have anything last, last to add? I, I just wanna, again, extend my thanks to everyone sitting at the table. Uh, I'm glad that we're able to finally get together in the same room and, and extend our appreciation for the legislature and for, for Senator Shelton for, this, these are the concerns we hear from the public. Like, oh, you get all this money and it's gonna get spent for these things that we don't need. And it, it's just, I'm sure, uh, relieving to know that we have the support of our elected officials to make sure that this money is going to be used for its intended purposes, which is to help folks who are dealing with substance abuse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. And thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for your time and for joining us this afternoon. To do us, my and to stay safe and stay healthy.